Now, in this video, we are going to discuss the relatively common condition known as hydrocephalus. Now, hydrocephalus in Greek literally means water head, and it is the result of an abnormal increase in the amount of cerebrospinal fluid within the confines of the skull. Now, the easiest way to understand hydrocephalus is in anatomical terms. And so, if we think of the ventricular system, which is where cerebrospinal fluid circulates within the brain, as well as the subarachnoid spaces, we can appreciate the different types of hydrocephalus that exist. So, if we draw out um, the ventricular anatomy, and we'll, we'll use boxes here, so uh, we'll start off with our uh, lateral ventricles here, so one lateral ventricle, one lateral ventricle, and they connect to um, an area known as the third ventricle, and the third ventricle then connects to the fourth ventricle, and the fourth ventricle then connects to the uh, sorry subarachnoid space surrounding the uh, spinal cord and then from here what happens is that the spinal fluid then makes its way back up uh, to the subarachnoid space uh, that overlies the brain tissue subarachnoid space of the brain and then finally f it's at this point that the spinal fluid gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream so one easy way to think of the way spinal fluid circulates throughout the brain is uh, like a river. And so if we start um, at a high elevation uh, um, up in the mountains, for example, um, the cerebrospinal fluid is going to be flowing downstream from the lateral ventricles through the foramen of Monroe to the third ventricle, then from the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, then from the fourth ventricle through the foramen of Magendi and Lushka to the subarachnoid space surrounding the spinal cord. Then from there, the subarachnoid space uh, surrounding the spinal cord is continuous with the subarachnoid space surrounding the brain. And then once uh, cerebrospinal fluid makes its um, uh, way to this subarachnoid space, it's absorbed into the bloodstream via things known as arachnoid granulations. Now... Uh, cerebrospinal fluid is constantly being made and then reabsorbed by the body, which brings us to exactly what hydrocephalus is. Now, hydrocephalus comes for the most part in, in two flavors, and the first flavor is known as a communicating, communicating hydrocephalus. So, what is a communicating hydrocephalus? A communicating hydrocephalus means that there is a um, the entire cerebrospinal fluid pathway is unable to reabsorb spinal fluid appropriately and usually it's a result of a failure on the part of the arachnoid granulations arachnoid granulations to uh, reabsorb that spinal fluid so as a result every all of the cerebrospinal fluid from this point backwards uh, ends up uh, building up. So you get uh, an enlargement of the lateral ventricle, you get an enlargement of the third ventricle, you get an enlargement of the fourth ventricle, and, uh, and that's uh, considered a communicating hydrocephalus. Now the second form of hydrocephalus is known as a non-communicating hydrocephalus. Now in a non-communicating hydrocephalus, what happens is that there is a block in a particular point within the cerebrospinal fluid pathway that's not at the end point where the arachnoid granulations are. So, for example, if you have a block in the cerebral aqueduct between the third and fourth ventricles, cerebral aqueduct, say, for example, uh, congenital aqueductal stenosis of a newborn, what happens is that the third 
and lateral ventricles are going to enlarge in size, but the fourth ventricle will stay relatively small. Because you can imagine it's almost as if you're building a dam at the level of the cerebral aqueduct, and that river is no longer able to flow past that dam, so the water is going to back up uh, behind the dam, and everything below the dam is going to be dry. Um, same thing can happen if you have, for example, a tumor, uh, maybe a brain tumor that's pushing on one of the foramen of Monroe. In that case, one of the lateral ventricles will increase in size, but the th other lateral ventricle and the third and fourth ventricles will remain normal uh, in size. And that is considered a, a, a non-communicating hydro uh, hydrocephalus. So overall, I think the easiest way to think about hydrocephalus is in terms of anatomical structure. Now, the, there are many different things that can cause a communicating in terms of pathology or a non-communicating hydrocephalus, and that's outside the scope of this particular video. But suffice, suffice it to say that I think the, the easiest way to think of, of hydrocephalus in clinical terms is first off figure out is it a communicating uh, or a non-communicating hydrocephalus, and, uh, and then based on that, you could start to narrow your differential diagnosis and try and come up with a reason for why that person may be developing hydrocephalus.